America, if you need starters, spark plugs, ball joints, gaskets, camshafts, U-joints, or rocker arms, anything that can be screwed or glued to that car or truck of yours, come see old Ray. Hey, you want a guarantee? I got a guarantee stamped on every box. Hi there, and welcome to Baseball by Design. I am SportsLogos.net minor league baseball correspondent Paul Caputo, broadcasting live, as always, from the Sunday Helmet Hall of Fame in my basement in Fort Collins, Colorado. Today, we're going to be talking about the high A Lansing Lugnuts, who play in Lansing, Michigan. Later on in this episode, you will hear from designer Dan Simon, who will be here with another of his studio Simon Stumpers, as he is every week. Right now, I am so happy to be joined by Jesse Goldberg Strassler, who is the broadcaster in charge of media relations for the Lansing Lugnuts. Jesse, good morning. How are you doing? Good morning. I'm great. Thank you very much for asking me on. Oh man, this is this is such a classic brand to talk about. I'm, I'm so glad to 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 have you on and to get to do this. The High A Lansing Lugnuts have one of the one of the early wacky nicknames in minor league baseball, right? Like there's a couple of them out there. I think the Carolina Mudcats, the Montgomery Biscuits. There's sort of a few that that came on the scene within a few years of one another. Uh, 1995 for the Lansing Lugnuts. That was well before the, you know, the era of, I don't know, the El Paso Chihuahuas and the Lehigh yeah. Valley Iron Pigs and, and all that. So the the wacky the wacky minor league baseball logo and nickname was 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 new in 1995. What kind of responsibility is that for for a team in minor league baseball to have to to be one of the standard bearers of the wacky era of minor league baseball? Yeah, I also think about the Portland Sea Dogs. That absolutely the Sea Dogs. Yeah, right around that same time, there weren't teams that shock value is the wrong thing. I would say geared toward families that kids should see this and love this, that who is minor league baseball for? And the 1990s uh, was being reinvented for independent baseball. And you think about what was happening with the St. Paul Saints and what Miles Wolf was doing. And so there was this whole idea of who is baseball's market? Who should we be trying to bring out to the ballpark? And instead of this is for hardcore baseball fans, it was very much this is for the people of this city to come out and have a great time. As Lansing Lugnuts ownership put it, Tom Dixon, Sherry Myers, the mission statement, outrageous was the word that they used. You should have an outrageously fun time at the ballpark. You should go nuts for the Lugnuts. <laughs> when you look at the finalists for the team name at the time, the Lugnuts chief rival was River Dragon. Lansing could have been the Lansing River Dragons, and you can still see that with the Lansing Lugnuts mascot. The big lug is a river dragon. <laughs> they, they were just trying to figure out, okay, what could we use to appeal? And in the end, they chose Lugnuts for the automotive nature of it. And lug nut in real life is two separate words. It's a kind of nut. It's a lug. But you put it together, you bring in the alliteration, you introduce Luggy the Lugnut in the team logo. And when this came out, this was enormously unpopular. The name was broken by the Lansing State Journal. There was some great journalism being done where someone had not taped a window where they had the retail store was about to open. <laughs> and a reporter for the LSJ stood on top of a dumpster to peer in and see it. And so you had all of the letters that were being written to the Lansing State Journal from everyone who is up in arms. What are we going to call them? The lugs? We're going to say go nuts? And the answer was yes. <laughs> and so it was fascinating to see that shift from when it was all announced in 1995 to when the team started play in 1996 and how much they were embraced. Hmm. The uh, so I mean you talk about this being a you know kid friendly right like the 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 lug nut himself has this this expression on his face, right? Like he's not grimacing. He's not, you know, <laughs> snarling. He he almost looks a little distressed, right? Like maybe he's not entirely well from all of this, this spinning. First of all, is that characterization fair, do you think? What do you think? What do you think of the expression on his face there? I would call him a bit dizzy because okay. after all he's spinning, I would call him goofy. That uh -huh. when you look at him, there's nothing scary. There's nothing off-putting. 
uh, we call West Michigan's logo the angry wave. It's very smug. And we're going, because if you look at the Whitecaps logo at the time, back in 1994, when they were introduced, it was a very different feel for their logo. And then they transitioned the angry wave as people are trying to anthropomorphize their logos. Now I would say everything about Luggy is to charm you, is to connect you to them and to go, this guy could use a friend right now. <laughs> the, you know, one of the things that's sort of amazing about this brand, right? Like introduced in 1994, the team started in 1995 the consistency of this brand over the years is in today's minor league baseball landscape pretty remarkable uh, has there ever been conversation about you know updating the look or alternate identities i mean the other sort of thing about that is that this brand was introduced at a time when there weren't nine alternate brands associated with it right like there's the the primary there's the script and then there's the standalone bolt and that's sort of it for the for the marks for this team so has there ever been talk? This, I guess two questions. Has there ever been talk about updating the brand? And what about introducing alternate marks that are sort of based on the existing brand? I'm glad you said Bolt, because for everyone who's unaware, Luggy is not actually a lug nut. That's not how lug nuts look. <laughs> That's funny. I said Bolt. You know what? I was going to ask about this later. He's yeah. he's a Bolt. He's not a lug he's nut. A bolt. Right? <laughs> it's kind of like how the Big Ten has more than 10 teams. The Lansing lug nuts, eh, it's not a lug nut. <laughs> <laughs> However, <laughs> Buffalo Bisons, the plural of bison is bison. So right, you don't, right. Yes, but <laughs> that, that's the charm of sports where you go, yeah, we know. We know that the foul pole is in fair territory, etc. cetera. Right. Uh, <laughs> now, to that, to that notion, I give Tom Dixon major credit because he believed so fiercely in the brand, and especially as retail numbers are coming out and the lug nuts are selling just as much or more gear than anybody else starting in 1996, right there in the top tens with the most popular AAA teams in the country. And AAA has always been a level based on winning and capturing championships. And so you, you are in these huge cities that in other sports are actually the major league city, but in baseball, they're that level below and yet you have the population and you're selling more tickets than at the lug nuts. Uh, the lug nuts at the time were single A. We moved up to high A after the pandemic, but we're a low A team. He believed so fiercely in who the lug nuts are and what Luggy and the lug nuts brand is that he did not want it changed. And when you look at the lug nuts brand reinventions, it's always been around the L. The L when it first came out in 1996 was blockish. Then they made the L more cartoonish in the early 2000s. Uh, then when the jerseys were changed, so at one point there were sleeveless jerseys, then they went full sleeve. They've leaned into the red, they've leaned into the black, they've leaned into the silver. But Luggy has never disappeared. There's always been Luggy front and center, and Luggy has always looked the exact same ever since 1996. So then things started to loosen with Tom over the course of the past couple of years, and April 1st, 2023, Lansing was sold to DBH. But up until the past couple of years, the Lugnuts did not have alternate uniforms, let alone an alternate identity. And it was something that Tyler Parsons fought for, now the general manager of the Durham Bulls, to get the Lugnuts part of the Copa de la Diversión program, so that way we could be the Lansing Locos as our very first alternate identity. And when you have not had that alternate identity for so long, to introduce it means more, makes things more significant that you can walk into the store or go to a game and it's the Lansing Lug Nuts, Let's Go Nuts, or the Lansing Locos, Vamos Locos, and these two very distinct color palettes for each of these teams. And the fact that we're going into our 28th season and you still see that same red, black, and silver, I see former Lugnuts players and coaches and the season ticket holders over years. And they get to see that same continuity is the word I'm looking for, that continuity ever since the start. And that means something that strengthens your connection. So this is not the first time you and I have spoken. We spoke back in 2015 for the article on uh, sportslogos.net that I wrote of the story behind the nickname which I called Dizzy in Michigan, the story behind the Lansing lug nuts. But we chatted about this uh, for that, that article back then. And we talked about the automotive industry in Lansing. But one of the things I remember from that conversation is we talked about the, 
I guess it's a smokestack that actually has like a bolt on top of it. Or actually, I think that it, that has a lug nut. And now I'm confusing myself on the lug nut versus the bolt. The Lansing Board of Water and Light across the street from our ballpark, Jackson Field, Caddy Corner, as you would say in Michigan. And the Lansing Lug Nuts Booster Club in 1996 paid however many thousands and thousands of dollars to install the world's largest stainless steel lug nut on top of their smokestack. It is amazing. And I will say to people as I'm leading them on the tour, I'll just say in passing, oh, world's largest lug nut. There's the big lug nut. And people look and they are staggered. There it is right across the street. It's our landmark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's really great. And Ben Hill from Minor League Baseball had a had a photo of it after he visited you all. So it's uh, I'll I'll have to post that online when when this uh, when this goes up for sure. In light of the fact that this brand has been so consistent over the years, especially you know, I mean, you you mentioned that the type changed over the course of the years, but the colors and you know, Luggy the lug nut are are largely the same. How have the alternate identities been embraced in the in the last year or two? They've been forgotten in terms of the River Dragons for a what ha, what if night. The Lansing Locos, the Copa identity, has been hugely embraced. I've been proud because I think that the whole purpose of the Copa de la Diversión initiative to say to minor league teams, who are you not reaching out to in your community and how do you reach out to them? And this is something just to put it to every single team. Every team is saying, who cares about baseball? Who is not coming to our games? Who doesn't care about baseball? Who isn't coming to our games? And what can we do to convince them? Well, if you have a population in your city, and probably you do, that is Spanish speaking, uh, and what can you do to to connect? Um, my wife works in social work. She works at Michigan State University as a, as a therapist. So we talk about Brene Brown as this naturally comes up, but also connection. And that whole idea of connecting for me as a broadcaster, I need to connect to my audience. And for a baseball team, they need to connect to their fan base. But more importantly, they need to connect to their community. A team and the community should be woven together, should be part of whatever that city is trying to do, we can help. So when we talk alternate brands, I'm going to bring in the Potter Park Zoo. Potter Park Zoo on December the 24th, 2020, uh, 2019, had a black rhino born. There were only one or two black rhinos are born that we know of every year. It's a highly endangered species. And there's one born in the Potter Park Zoo a day after my own baby was born. So I got very connected with this. And I'm going, we can work with the Potter Park Zoo and Rhino Conservancy. And we were the Lansing Black Rhinos for every single Sunday on family day with our rhinos uniform and everything was to support the zoo and to support rhinos. So Jolly, the baby black rhino is now off in another zoo right now as they're trying to help that zoo and continue the breeding program. But I think when it comes to alternate identities, it's, what's the, it's what the fans embrace and what you stand for that means more. So to circle back around to the Lansing Locos, to be able to connect us further to very important organizations in our community to the people that we can say this resonates more if you're a Latino if if there's something about this that you say no this this can be me for um Cinco de Mayo that we can have a, a ton of food trucks out in front of the stadium we can turn it into a full fiesta at our ballpark uh there are, there's so much that that you can open up and say what can we do to make you feel comfortable? For me personally, I remember going to a Lake County Captains game and I'm Jewish and they held a Jewish heritage night. And I'm going, this is never something that I've ever seen before the ballpark, but my goodness, I can get matzo ball soup here at the concession stands. The mascot is dancing the horror with the fans or whatever can make you feel, hey, this is baseball combined with me. And I connect baseball so much to my identity, but there's more to me, like there's more to everybody else. That I think has been the importance of the Lansing Locos. So this past year, our very first, uh, our very last Lansing Locos game at the ballpark, September, walking around in front of the gates before the gates are about to open, as people are buying their tickets or getting ready to come in and seeing all of the different people who wore their Lansing Locos gear to the ballpark that had been previously purchased. And they were so excited to cheer on the Locos that night. 
that to my mind is what an ideal alternate identity is, that there's something about that day that means something a little bit more. You know, you've, you've phrased it so eloquently, the, the importance of these, these nights that highlight a community to accentuate inclusivity in, in baseball. And I think it's so important in so many different ways. When we talk about the Hispanic Heritage Nights through the uh, Copa de la Diversión, uh, you talk about Pride Nights, you talk about nights that spe- you know, specifically highlight a, a specific uh, background or ethnicity. I mean, I just think that it's so important to to do that in in baseball. And so I appreciate you you bringing that up and highlighting it like that. Just that notion, those short words of saying, everyone is welcome. And what does that mean? And how do we make sure that everyone is everyone? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Such an important thing. I really appreciate you bringing that up because it's 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 important to me. And, and I appreciate that it's important to you and to the lug nuts as well. One of the alternate brands that is less about that and more about you know this sort of larger uh, minor league baseball program is uh, obviously the the Marvel series, the uh, the Marvel logos. You brought visual aids to uh, the audio podcast here. I appreciate that. But here he is, the 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 Marvel guy on the cap that you have here. This Marvel identity is the first new luggy since 1995, and that you know that's sort of a big deal, right? Like, I mean, that's three decades of of luggy basically, and then you have this new one here. How was that received within the team and within uh, within the community? I, I should first tell you that visual aids on audio, that's what I'm all about because when <laughs> I got out of college, I could not break into baseball. And I wanted to be a baseball broadcaster, whatever that meant. And I didn't have any idea what that meant. I just wanted to work in baseball as a broadcaster. So first I worked in audio description around the Washington, D.C. area for people mm. who are visually impaired. Mm. I'm describing theater and musicals and arts. So I I think that in order to help someone see, that it helps for me to see. So for example, the Marvel artist depiction of Luggy is Thor's silver hammer with Luggy's eyes, which are no longer goofy or confused, but knowing and knowing in, I would say, a devious manner. There's blue shading on either side to demonstrate the shadowing. And also this is now taking place at night because we've got lightning emanating around Luggy, which is now no longer twirling about, but is staying static in the air as all of that electricity is conducted. And the lightning is outlined first in blue and then in red with the red all the way around the silver Luggy. Is that a good enough description of what we've got going on? That's an amazing description. And you know, what's interesting about what you're doing is actually part of, we were talking about inclusivity. One of the things that that we do for the nonprofit association that I work for is every time we get on a Zoom call now, we introduce ourselves with our, our pronouns and a visual description of ourselves for people who might be on the call, who have low vision or might be driving or, you know, are not available, you know, somehow for some reason cannot see what we actually look like. We'll describe ourselves. Well, you know, I'm a middle-aged man with red hair and a beard that's going slightly gray because of my children. And and so <laughs> that that sort of thing. So it's interesting to hear you do that so uh so coherently to, you know, that that description really was evocative of of, of that logo. So I appreciate that because it's something that we are starting to see, I think, in the world now, especially in this this world of Zoom, of not just assuming everyone can can see the same thing. So anyway, so I appreciate that. I do a broadcast each year that is a retro broadcast, a throwback game recreation broadcast where you can picture me slamming a bat against another bat or cracking a ball into a glove. And I'm recreating the game that's happening in front of me. And this is just to pay tribute to the way that broadcasters used to do it. But when I do that, I cannot see the game. And suddenly it is more important to me, I realize what does a player look like? What does a stance look like? What does a pitcher's windup look like? What does the defensive positioning look like? Everything that I can't see, the next game that I call that I can see, I go, I need to make sure that someone is aware. What color is the bill of the cap? What color is the uniform, the belt, the socks? Are they pulled up, et cetera? So I do think everything that we can do to help paint the picture, I think that's good. And I think that helps make everything the more vivid and brings people closer to it. Absolutely. And it's one of the reasons that 
just baseball on the radio. There's no other sport like baseball on the radio. You know, it's just like there's you know you get out there on the on the back porch with a, a lemonade or whatever, and you know put the ball game on the radio. And there's there's really nothing like it. So what a what a skill that you have to be able to uh, to evoke that for for the listener. So I really appreciate that for sure. And then you talk about the different logos because mm. you had asked, okay, this new luggy, what was everyone's reaction? This is a skill I have that, that I'm working on in terms of bringing things back around to the point because <laughs> you asked a really good question and I don't want, I don't want to avoid it. The question of this is a new looking luggy. What did people think? And people loved it. A different iteration of luggy, a luggy that's powerful and strong and confident without question. The players love these uniforms, which also featured the luggy across the front of the chest, in addition to full center on the cap, no L on the cap, just this luggy with the red brim and the luggy on the black background. And I think that there's something that's fun about that. And there's something that captured the imagination about all of this, that whether it was our players or whether it was our fans, these Marvel Knights were hugely celebrated and really enjoyed. They were greatly anticipated. And then in the moment, yeah, this looks great. And I have to tell you that we only got to this point because of the work put in by my coworkers. Terry Allipert's in charge of all of our graphic design and working with the rest of the front office staff. Tyler Parsons first, when he left to go to Durham, then Zach Clark took over, uh, rising from assistant GM to GM, and Greg Kiger and more. The Marvel artist sent in the rough draft, said, here's my thought, what do you guys think? And we said, no, <laughs> that's not going to work for us. So they worked through many different iterations and drafts and just trying to figure out what is this going to look like to get to this final product, which I think we're very proud of. You know, the Marvel, I hope I can say this in a fair way. I think the Marvel logos were met with a mixed reaction on yes. social media. Uh, I think that that this one is one of the more successful ones, uh, this you know, recognizable character from the team who is, uh, you know, just sort of a different thored up version of of that that character. And yeah, not he doesn't have the dizzy sort of confused look on his face, right? Like he's a much more confident version of this, this logo and without the L, right? Like it centers the character without, you know, without that letter L there. So let me put you on the spot if you don't mind. Yeah. Because I think that this asks a very important question that I love the question. And in Jewishness, the question is more important than the answer. The question is about logos. You have these artists who, they are very great at what they do, which mm -hmm. is comic books, which is the splash page, the mm -hmm. cover image, and then telling the story through the art and bringing action into a static image. However, their goals are very different from the goals of a minor league baseball graphic designer, a, a person who's trying to figure out a logo. So for you, what makes a great logo? You know, it's, it's such an interesting question because I've said on this podcast before that I feel like logo design is a little bit like wizardry. My background's in graphic design. It's not in logo design, which is a very specific subset of graphic design. Illustration and logo design are very different. And I think what you're getting at here is part of what caused the mixed reaction to the Marvel series was that, was that they were very intricate and very, very, they were very detailed. You know, the, 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 what, one of the things the lug nuts did so well that sort of set them as a standard bearer for this wacky era of minor league baseball logos was the simplicity, right? The thick lines, the recognizable character, the simple letter L, you know, whether it was the block one or the sort of more fun one that came later, um, to me, to sort of sum it up, you know, as best I can, the logo needs to be the face of an organization. When logos go bad, it's when they try to make it the entirety of an organization, right? Like it just needs to be the face. It doesn't need to be the whole body. And I think that that simplicity is, is the first step there. And I think it's what the, the high-end designers are doing so well right now is these, these simple, the thick lines, the, 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 the fun individual characters that are immediately recognizable. I, I think once you overcomplicate a logo, it, it, it loses its, its recognizability from, you know, more than six feet away and, and, and you've lost people. So let me transition back into Copa because I would argue that the Lugnuts Copa identity, the Locos, 
for those who like it, one of the big keys is, in addition to the turquoise and the marigold color scheme, it's just the potu bird. It's just the face of a potu bird, which is a very silly face, and there's no great complexities around it. And I think that's the case for all of the great Copa logos is they just said, look, here it is, simple, and you get the point, and that's it. Whereas the ones that lost it a little bit were the ones that really got lost in the weeds. I think that that's absolutely true. And if you haven't seen, I'll, I'll have to post this one too when I when this episode goes up. But the, yeah, he is a very silly bird. I mean, I think that's there's no two ways about it is that's a, a silly bird. The potu bird, which I didn't know, but apparently indigenous to Central and South America. The definition, as you say on the website, it's a definition of a loco creature with its big eyes and its tongue hanging out. So yeah, that's a really, that's a really fun one. And, you know, in general, I think that the Copa program has been a lot more successful than the Marvel program was. Yeah. And Lansing, you guys, I I think you guys did great with both of them. I love the Locos and I love the the Marvel brand. Yeah. What the Copa got right is the colors. Like yeah. if I say Lansing lug nuts to people, it's luggy. And mm -hmm. it's the red and the black. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. if we think about the really great brands in sports, in my opinion, you can immediately go to Dodger Blue or the Cardinal or the powder blue uniform that a team might suddenly hit a home run with. I'm wearing my Oakland A's gear because now we're an A's affiliate and nobody does green and gold like the Oakland A's. So the fact that the Lugnuts have our distinct red and black and silver and with the Copa that the Lansing Locos could go distinctive turquoise and marigold. My favorite Copa identities have had those really great color schemes. Absolutely. Well, and and like you say, to bring it back to the lug nuts, I think that 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 red and black is so iconic for the lug nuts. And you know this this lug nuts brand has been just a stalwart for almost three decades in in minor league baseball, and so it has been. So much fun to get to talk about this with you. I've kept you longer than I meant to, but you know, it's just been such a fun, fun conversation. I think that that's okay. So Jesse, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to have this conversation with me. Where can people find you? Where can people find the lug nuts on social media online? At Lansing Lug Nuts, wherever you want to look. We're pretty easy. We do not have a lot of imitators. And same thing for me. If you look up Jesse Goldberg Strassler, there are not too many other Jesse Goldberg Strasslers out there. So J Goldstrass, J-G-O-L-D-S-T-R-A-S-S, -S -S, Lansing Lugnuts, M-I-L-B.com slash Lansing, LansingLugnuts.com. You'll find us. As always, this will all be in the show notes. Jesse, thank you so much. This has been such a pleasure. I've really enjoyed getting to speak with you. Oh, I appreciate you. Thank you. It is time once again for my favorite segment, your favorite segment of the Baseball by Design podcast, where Dan Simon of Studio Simon, live from Louisville, Kentucky, stops by with a Studio Simon stumper, where he has been successful in recent weeks at attempting to stump me in answering a trivia question that he prepares for each episode. Good morning, Dan. How are you doing? I am fantastic. I, I know that you've been stumped for the mm. past several episodes. I think this one, you not only have a fighting chance, I I don't want to, like, like saying something's a great movie and then you tell somebody to see it and you, you talk it up so much, they're inevitably going to be disappointed because it will never live up to that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to like jinx you by saying, I, I really think you're going to get this one, but I think you've... Um, I think you have a bit, a, a good chance, Let, and okay. we'll find out in a moment if that is indeed the case. So let's jump right into it. Uh, this episode features the Lansing Lugnut, so our studio Simon Stumper today asks, which of these names that fall into the hardware fastener category <laughs> was not or currently is not a name of a professional or Collegiate Summer League Baseball Club? Is it A, Rivets, B, Screwballs, or C, Wing Nuts? Is not or was not the name of a professional or Collegiate Summer League Baseball team? The This is, um, this is a two truths and a lie. Two so, truths and a lie, yes. And one of my favorite formats of the studio assignment, Stumpers. Pretty sure that the answer is screwballs, that that is the one that is not. 
Uh, Wing Nuts, famously played in Wichita, the Wichita Wing Nuts, uh, were were a team. In fact, the cover of the story behind the nickname, the book that is a collection of articles I wrote for SportsLogos.net, this picture was taken on the field at a Wichita Wing Nuts game. So, uh, so I I know pretty well that the Wichita Wing Nuts were a thing. The Rivets is one that I can picture. I forget where they're from. I think it's a collegiate summer level team. They've got like a sort of black and silver and gold identity. I can picture that, I think, fairly well. I think Screwballs is the answer based on a shaky version of actual knowledge. I am pretty sure that Rivets exist and that Screwballs do not. Okay. You're off the schneid. You are correct. (laughs) Um, And uh, now there is a is or was a minor league mascot named Screwball, probably mm. not surprisingly. I'm not sure if it's still out there. It was was or still is the Reading Phillies mascot. Oh. So not not sure. I know it was out there 10 years ago, but uh you know they they then became the that's when they were still just the Reading Phillies. When they changed to the fighting fills, not sure if uh, if Screwball lo- lost his job at that point. <laughs> um, but uh, let us let us know any of anybody who there in Reading, somebody who works for Reading, a fan of the team, or anyone who else would otherwise know. Let us know. Is Screwball still uh, entertaining the fans in in Reading. Um, so the other you you were, I figured you would know the the Wichita Wing Nuts. It seems to me that your knowledge of collegiate summer league teams um, are, you may not know as many of them as you do minor league teams, as is the case with most people. Um, As a sports branding professional, it's my job to know as many professional, collegiate, even amateur teams as possible. It's... It's uh, just to know what's being done on on the landscape of of sports branding, but also just to make sure that I'm not doing something that is potentially derivative of Mm -hmm. something that's already been done. So I I, I need to know what's out there. So every now and then I'll, I'll, I'll hear of uh, of a team I had not heard of before, but um, that's mainly with, with, like D3 and and D2 colleges. Um, But every now and then a collegiate summer league team I might not have heard of, but um, the the Wichita Wing Nuts um, were an independent minor league baseball team that played in the American Association from 2008 to 2018. Um, In 2008, they replaced the affiliated AA Southern League Wichita Wranglers when that team moved to Springdale, Arkansas, where they became the, what are they now known as? Uh, Springdale, Arkansas, of course, is the Northwest Arkansas Naturals. Correct. And there is now a double A team in, again, affiliated double A team in Wichita called the, um, the Wind Surge, a Todd Radom brand identity. Mm-hmm. friend of the show great um, team store yep. and the rockford rivets are a collegiate summer league team playing in the northwoods league so and you described them you you had a kind of a cloudy recollection but what you described as far as colors sounded like what what their identity is so you you've indeed seen it may not have exactly been top of mind but um your recollection was correct and you uh you're now back in the the winners category of Studio Simon Stumpers. Back in the winners column, yeah, it, it was one I, I could I could picture it. I didn't remember that they were from Rockford, but I could picture their logo. And uh, Screwballs was just a little too on the nose, right? Like you know, it's a minor league team called Screwballs, like that's something out of a Simpsons episode there. So when I was trying to come up with a lie for this we, we had the two truths the rivets and the wing nuts I and mean, i was trying to think of okay what's this fictitious team that might sound like a real team i was as i mentioned it's it's in the um 
the hardware fastener category. You know, <laughs> you've got nuts and bolts and screws and things like that, but there are surprisingly few words like wing nuts in that category and rivets um, that would make for a good name. And the, the other, it was down to two fictitious names that I came up with. I decided to go with screwballs, um, but the, the other one was based on um, screws and the different kinds of screwdrivers. You have a Phillips head screwdriver, and a flathead screwdriver. Mm. So I was I was thinking the flatheads. Uh, that <laughs> might have tripped that, me up. That one might have tripped me up. <laughs> well, I was actually thinking, like, what would what would like would anybody name a team the flatheads? I can see naming a team the screwballs. Right. Um, especially yeah. if maybe you've got you you live in a city, like the there used to be a minor league team in uh, where is it that the uh, Hartford, the, where the yard goats play in Hartford, that's apparently known as Hardware City. So you had the Hardware City Rockcats. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and so if you lived, let's just say Hardware City, a, a, a place where there's a factory that makes hardware fasteners. Right. Um, and if they made screws there, maybe the screwballs could have been a team name. I suppose if you live somewhere where, you know, craftsman tools maybe used to be mm. headquartered, they're mm. no longer made in the United States. Um, they're made overseas, like so many other things. Uh, if you, but wherever craftsman was headquartered, you know, maybe you would name it after a screwdriver and name the team the Flatheads. But <laughs> um, with an anthropomorphized screwdriver as your your logo, but uh, right. Screwballs yeah. is good though, right? As screwballs, you know, I mean, there's this, there's the double entendre. It would pay homage. I could see Hardware City. By the way, Hardware City Rock Cats were uh, a Guy Gilchrist creation. Uh, Guy Gilchrist of Muppets fame. He also created the the bee from the Binghamton. Uh, was it Buddy Bee from the Binghamton Bees? And uh, and of course, his most famous creation in minor league baseball circles is the uh, Portland Sea Dogs. So. He's a uh, he, uh, former guest of this podcast on the Portland Sea Dogs episode. So, for the purpose of accuracy, um, it was the Bing Binghamton Mets. You know uh, what? <laughs> You're absolutely right. And it's funny that you say that because sometimes I'll go on eBay and I'll look for minor league baseball stuff on eBay. I haven't done it in a long time, but I remember I used to see the the Burlington Bees and the Salt Lake Bees. You would constantly have these Binghamton Mets brands that uh, with Buddy B on them, and people who were selling this stuff didn't, you know, didn't couldn't identify where he came from, and uh, and so you would constantly see these these things with Buddy B from the Binghamton Mets identified as being the Burlington Bees or the Salt Lake Bees, and I used to send them messages like I I sent this probably to like five six seven people saying, hey, that's, you know, you've identified this team wrong. And, you know, I don't I don't do that anymore, mostly because I'm not really on eBay that much anymore. But I remember one person came back and like really super argued with me about like, oh, sure, there's a Bumblebee who's a logo for the Mets, like, of course, right. And so it became like this sort of thing for me where I actually had friends who were on eBay, email this person and say, hey, I'm really interested in this item. But uh, can you confirm that that's really the team that it's from? Because I don't recognize that logo. And uh, finally, after like three or four messages from different people, the person like finally relented and changed <laughs> changed the listing. I don't know if I'll keep this in this episode because it makes me seem like a wackadoodle. But uh, no, you're it... going to keep it in the episode because that leads to something that you and I experienced together, and somebody mistaking a oh yeah a logo or uniform um, and attributing it to the wrong team, and coincidentally. It was the bees, mm -hmm. the and, New Britain bees, right? And this happened when you and I and Baseball Bucket List podcast host Anna Di Tommaso and a uh, friend of the show Ranger Amy were in Birmingham visiting the 
Negro Southern League Museum, which is located adjacent to their beautiful, relatively new downtown ballpark. And there was a uniform for the, uh, it was a New Britain Bees that, that is a collegiate summer league team. I, I don't, I'm not sure if they still exist, um, but they, but they were fairly recent. That identity was done by friend of the show, Sky Dillon. And in the museum, that uniform was in a display case featuring, I don't remember the guy's name, but a Negro Leagues, Negro Southern League player who was born in and maybe lived his entire life in in Birmingham. Um, and they attributed that to him. And I knew there that was not a that he put that was a Negro Leagues uniform. And I knew right away it wasn't because I'm, I'm familiar with the identity and who did it. Um, and so the the um, what's what's the name of the gentleman who the curator, Frank Adams, Jr. Right. Frank Adams was there um at the museum and you know we we were talking with him and i i, I kind of hesitantly I, I i remember saying to you should i tell him <laughs> uh, and you you because i i didn't want to like shame him you know it no. was it, i and i didn't want to make him feel bad but you know it was you know it's a museum and mm -hmm, i mm -hmm. I, I figured we they would want to know. I was hoping yeah. they would want to know. And I pointed it out to him. And I just felt terrible. I still felt terrible about it. <laughs> and and I apologized to him. I and and he said, no, we, you know, we need to know. And yeah. um, and they, you know, made a call. Even while we were there, he called somebody and I and I just said, I promise you, I know that was not a Negro League's um yeah. uh, identity. It's a collegiate summer league team in New Britain. Connecticut. Um, Coming full circle, by the way, New Britain, Connecticut, where the New Britain Rock Cats played, who they were the aforementioned Hardware City Rock Cats. Right. So um, now, by the way, we another thing just for the, the edification of your listeners, uh, we've referred to this B on the the Buddy the B, is that what you call them? The, yeah, from Buddy the B. Houston Mets. And you might be thinking, why did they have a B in their um as in at, in their logo? The reason for that was Binghamton Mets was shortened to B Mets. Like that's how they'd be referred to. Um, like in Kannapolis, you'll refer to people there will refer to it as K-Town. So mm -hmm. the B Mets and that's they didn't have anything else to um <laughs> It was the most interesting thing you can do with Binghamton Mets as a as a brand, right? So that's um, that's why they had to be in their logo. So there you have it. Uh, again, the things you learn on the I'll tell you Fine podcast. We ended up all over the place this morning. I really enjoyed it as always, Dan Simon. I know you're super busy. I'm going to let you get back to work, but thank you as always for the hard work you do preparing these questions and the uh, the, the the banter that we get to enjoy every week on the Baseball by Design podcast. Uh, the, the pleasure was mine. So thank you very much for having me on yet again. And I look forward to the next one. See you next week. See ya.